Chag Sameach, that means happy festival, uh, and Shabbat Shalom. Today is Simchat Torah, but that's not the biblical name of this day. The biblical name is Shemini Atzeret. Shemini means eighth, and Atzeret means like completion or like pulling together and bringing something to its culmination, to its, to its target, basically. That's what today is. We have been, we have been since Elul 1, uh, the whole month of Elul was repentance, then came Rosh Hashanah, the, the uh, new year, the day that God is judged, the day that the kingdom comes, the day that the resurrection takes place. Ten days later is Yom Kippur, and that's the day of atonement when the Messiah literally comes to earth, and um, seven years after the birth pangs in the day of the Lord. And then comes Sukkot five days later, and uh, that's a picture of the marriage supper, or the marriage feast, a mishte in Hebrew, and that's a picture of the kingdom. That is the ultimate picture of the kingdom. Well, now we've gone through the seven days of Sukkot, and now today is Shemini Set at the eighth day. It is the last festival of the year, and we are tired because we've been through 40. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 40, 12, 52 days, 52 days of a season. And now we've come to that 52nd day, and it's over. It's the completion, the atzeret of this entire time period. So um, there's no real um, big, big uh, biblical rituals or prayers or anything on Shemini Atzeret. It's kind of a day that's different. It's the eighth day, which is a picture of the New Jerusalem after the kingdom. And it's just sort of a time to start gearing up to rest. Because we have now the only month in the entire year coming up, Cheshvan, in which there is nothing. There's no festivals. The only thing there is is Shabbat, of course, and the new moon of Cheshvan, uh, Rosh Chodesh of Cheshvan. But that's it. There's no festivals, there's no fasts, there's no times at all. Only month like that in the year. And we need it, because we need to rest after the Etanim, that means the Great Ones. That's a title for the month of Tishri in the Bible, Etanim, the Great Ones, the High Ones. So, we are going to, I'm going to teach something very strange today, because uh, it's Shemini Atzeda, but it's also, it's, it has become known as uh, Simchat Torah, the rejoicing over the Torah. That's not a biblical title, it's not a biblical concept, except that it is a biblical concept, because we come to the end of the Torah. And then we roll the scrolls back to the beginning of the Torah. And so this is the culmination. It's the Atzeret of the Bible, too, of the Torah also. So because it's the last Torah portion of Devarim, Deuteronomy, and uh, I'm going to teach you something very obscure from the last Torah portion of Devarim. And it's about the kingdom. It is about the kingdom. And uh, I'm going to sing a song that we sang at Sukkot, at the end of the, the services for Sukkot, the end of the, the service for Sukkot, the big one. It's, called, it's from the Hallel. We, we do Hallel. Hallel is, uh, is the word Hallelujah, Hallel Yah, which means praise. And it means to be bright or clear or actually appear insane. And uh, the Hallel Psalms are, um, we're going to do Psalm 114. I'm going to sing a part of Psalm 114. I love the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 113 through 118. I love the Hallel Psalms. And they're like a big, a big uh, climax of worship for Sukkot. They're also at the other festivals too, Hallel. Because these were sung in the temple.
Now, what I want to, I want to tell you what the Hebrew says, and then what the English translation is. Noda bihuda Elohim, Yisrael gadol shemo, Haita Yehuda lekadsho, Yisrael mam shelotav. And what this means is God is known in Judah. This is God's word. And you cannot change it. You can't erase it. You can't manipulate it or twist it. God is known among the Jews in Judah. That's Judaism. That's where God is known. That's where we get our knowledge of God. That's why this is so important to me. Because I'm not seeing a lot of believers, even Messianic, saying that we get our knowledge of God from Judaism, but we do. Because God is known in Judah. In Israel, God's name is great. Judah is his sanctuary. That means his temple, his, his, where he lives. Judah, the Jewish people, are his sanctuary. Israel, his ruling place. God is known in Judah, in Israel God's name is great. Judah his sanctuary, Israel his ruling place. So oh, God is known in Judah, in Israel God's name is great. Judah his sanctuary, Israel his ruling place, his ruling place. His tabernacle is in Shalem, his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the fiery arrows of the bow and the shield and the sword, the weapons of a war. At your rebuke, God of Yaakov, your judgment is heard from heaven. The earth stood still and feared, and God arose to judge, to save all the humble lover. Because God is known in Judah, in Israel God's name is great. Judah his sanctuary, Israel his ruling place. God is known in Judah, in Israel God's name is great. Judah his sanctuary, Israel, his ruling place, his ruling place. Oda Behuda Elohim, by Israel, God does Haita Yehuda Lakadsho Israel Mam Shalotam God is known in Judah In Israel God's name is great Judah is his sanctuary And Israel his ruling place God is known in Judah in Israel, God's name is great. Judah, his sanctuary. Israel, his ruling place. His ruling place. Judah is not different from Israel. 
I know they were two houses. I know that there are many, many, many doctrines going around for the last oh, about 75 years that Israel are the Gentile believers. This is a lie. It's not true. Israel and Judah are always synonymous in the scriptures. If you don't believe me, go look at the book of Ezekiel, the one where it has the two sticks of, of Ephraim and Judah coming together as different sticks into one stick. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel in the same passages talks to Judah because remember he was a prophet to Judah, not to northern Israel, to southern Judah. He was a prophet in Judah. He was there when Babylonians came and dragged Judah away in exile. He was there. He saw it. He experienced it. and He was taken to Babylon with them. And to Judah he called the people he was talking to Israel. Israel, 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 Israel. Dozens and dozens of times. And he's not the only one. Jeremiah did the same thing. Isaiah did the same thing. All the southern prophets did the same thing. So if you have, and I'm going to discuss this in the teaching, if you have in your mind that Judah is the Jews and Israel is the Gentile believers, you're wrong. It is not a biblical doctrine. It is, a, it's, it is, that doctrine comes out of replacement theology. That's where it came from. And so if you can merge yourself and say, oh, I'm Israel, what do we need the Jews for? Because they're Israel. They've been replaced. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But it's an important, important facet that you know about the Bible. That Israel and Judah are the same people. God created them, God made them, and God called them what he wanted to call them. So the name of this teaching is you got to fight for your right to the kingdom. There was a song back in the 80s, I think, by the Beastie Boys, who were Jews, by the way, just as an aside. They were all Jews. And they would say, you got to fight for your right to party. Well, that's what I'm saying. you got to fight for your right for the kingdom. And that's what I'm going to teach about. you got to fight for it. You don't get the kingdom of God by just going... Oh, Lord, let me have the kingdom. It doesn't work. You've got to fight for it. And I'm going to show you this. We're going to talk about one tiny little aspect. One tiny little, not even a paragraph, just a few verses of the prophecy to the tribe of God uh, in Vezot Habracha. Now, Vezot Habracha, the last Torah portion of, of, uh, of the Torah, says... And the zot, this, it's a pointing word, and this is the blessing. And then he, he gives a blessing to the 12 tribes, and then he dies. So we're just going to lift one little tiny section from that about Gad. It's very hard to pronounce Gad. It's kind of in between a and a. Ah. And this is what God said through Moshe about God. Happy, blessed, is the one who enlarges God. He, God, lies down as a lion and tears the arm, also the hairy top of the head. Then he saw, now that's the word Yireh, like uh, Adonai Yireh, Jehovah Jireh, Adonai Yireh, from Genesis 22 when Abraham uh, offers his son Yitzchak, and it says, he named the place Adonai Yira, God saw or God provided. And this is the same word. Then he saw or provided for himself the first part. For there was the lawgiver's portion hidden. And I've checked every single one of the words in this passage to make sure I'm giving you a very good, accurate, clean translation. Um, the word hidden is covered or preserved. We're going to talk more about that. He came with the heads of the people, did righteousness of the Lord, and his judgments with Israel. Now this is talking about the tribe of Gad, just one of the little tribes, no cares, no big deal. If you think that Israel 
busted up into the nations and the believers are from one of those tribes, you are wrong. There might be a few, but you're wrong. It's just not biblical. There are the tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, of northern Israel, that were taken into Assyria, and some of them were brought back into the land as Samaritans. That's where the Samaritans came from, the wicked, disgusting, evil Samaritans. There's no such thing as a good Samaritan. That's why Yeshua taught that parable, because it's so ridiculous. He wanted to make a point. That's like saying the good Nazi. I'm going to tell a parable about the good Nazi. And those, these were horrible people, the Samaritans. And then some of the Jewish people, some of Israel, the northern tribes, got spread out to other places. But it is nothing like you think. It's nothing like, you know, you're a believer so you can figure out what tribe you're from. That is, that is a disgusting doctrine. It's not biblical at all. So, God, this one little tribe from Zilpah, the handmaid of Leah. Now, this, this is how it works in Judaism. You have Rachel, who was the loved. Then you have Leah, who was the unloved. Then you have Rachel's maid, Bilhah. And then on the bottom of the barrel, you have Zilpah. And that's where Dan and, and um, God came from. It's the bottom of the barrel. barrel. This is like the least of the least. But that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the least of the least, God. But they were amazing. Amazing. So here's the tribe of God. This is where it was. It's on the other side of the river. Here's West Israel, and here's East Israel. And um, from the very beginning of their history, before, I mean, back in Genesis, before they had done anything, good or bad, there were prophecies given to all the tribes. And it's only much, much, much later that Gad ended up over here on the west, I'm sorry, on the east of Jordan. But in the very beginning, before they'd done anything really, the prophecies were given by Jacob, and he said in Genesis 49, 19, As for God, troops shall attack him, but he will attack their heels. That's all he said about this tribe. That's all he said. And this is a prophecy about the day of the Lord, just like all the prophecies are of the tribes. But it's more than that. It's also a prophecy that kind of lays out the whole plan of the tribes, who they were, what they were like, where they were. Now, in Judaism, a lot of rabbis or a lot of Jews that weren't rabbis said that this word God means luck or fortune. And so a lot of Bibles will translate translate Leah saying, oh, fortunate am I, God, because I had a son. Maybe. But a better translation is a troop, which means a warrior, somebody who goes to war. And you can tell from the from the prophecy that was given by Jacob that this is what it means. Because it says, God gudud yegudenu vuhu yagud akev. Now you can hear that word, God, gud, yagad. You can hear it several times in this verse. As for God, troops shall attack him, but he will attack at their heels. So if it means luck, it would be this. As for uh, Gad, Luck will, it, will luck him, but he will luck their heels. It makes no sense whatsoever. This is about warfare, and it's clearly about warfare. So, uh, Gad Gadud, Gad, troops, Gadud, Yigudenu, will attack him, will troop him, will warrior him, Vahu and he, Yigud will attack them back, will, will troop them back. Ekev, that means at their heels. And it, this is definitely about warfare. There's just no way around it. That from the very first words spoken about these guys, it's about warfare. 
Now what I'm going to tell you is this, that if you're a Christian, if you're not fighting to enter the kingdom because Christ has done the work and you can rest, then you're not doing what the Bible says to do. And I'm going to show you this. I'm, I'm not going to just say it. I'm going to prove it. That you must fight to get anything from that kingdom. Well, you've got to know what the kingdom is first. This is what we're going to talk about. That Gad knew how to do this. The tribe of Gad, they knew how to fight. Not just fight for God, you know, in some generic sense. But I mean fight for the kingdom to get something from God. And that's what I want for you. I want you to be able to get something from God. I want you to be able to go to God and fight for it and wrestle with the enemy and get the enemy away and get something from God. And, it, and I got news for you. Most prayers that Christians pray don't do this. Most, most prayers, and this, you know, you can believe this or not believe it, but if you look at the body of prayers in Judaism, and then you look at the body of prayers in Christianity, you'll see a huge disconnect. Just like there's an enormous chasm between Judaism and Christianity, and you can't argue with that, there is an enormous chasm for 2,000 years between Judaism and Christianity, something has to bridge that gap. Well, Christians say the way you bridge that gap is you get those Jews and you drag them into our world. And what I say is just the opposite, because the Bible says no. The body of Messiah is a Jewish thing that has to go back to Judaism and get what God originally implanted in it and embedded in it. That's what I believe. That's what I'm saying. So if you want to bridge that gap and you want to pray like Jews pray, like God told his body to pray as Jews because it was a Jewish thing, then you're going to have to learn how to do, quote, spiritual warfare properly. This is a big deal. This is a huge thing. Many, many, many Christians have gotten offended because of what I'm saying right now. And they've left. They've left me, they've left my teachings, they've left my family, they've left my friendship. They've turned against me and my wife and my family because of what I'm saying right now. That, you know, I had the audacity to say, sorry, but you're praying amiss. Well, I got news for you. You're allowed to say that. You're allowed, when you see a prayer that's amiss, you're allowed to say you're praying amiss. But you better know what you're talking about. Now, in... Numbers 32, um, Gad, Manashe, and Reuben, who were on the other side of the Yarden, that's where they chose to stay. They chose to stay on the other side of the Yarden, and so that's where their land was given. And they said this because this whole area, from the Golan Heights all the way down to what is now Jordan, all the way down to the land of Moab in southern Jordan. Uh, they, <clears throat> they said, this is good pasture land. Now you look at it now and it's just desert. But it didn't used to be desert. It used to be really nice pasture land. Kind of like Colorado with those long rolling hills of low grass or grass that's really good for sheep and cows and, and things like that. And they saw, that, I mean, there were, you know, 100,000 acres of this. And so they said, we, this is where we want to be. And so that's where they stayed. So they said it was good for livestock, and so they stayed over there. Now in Deuteronomy 33.20, where we come to the passage that we're in now, at the end of uh, the Torah, it says, He lies down as a lion, and tears the arm and the hairy top of the head. But in 1 Chronicles 12, 300, what am I saying? Almost a thousand years later, it says this about that same tribe of God. From Gad came to David men of valor, men of war, fit for the battle, who could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions. Now this is really important, and it is the exact opposite of what is on the internet, which I'm going to show you. 
I don't want you to get deceived and follow it thinking that it's a good thing. It is not a good thing. It's a horrible, horrible thing. They had the faces of lions, and they were swift as the gazelles on the mountains. He who was least was equal to a hundred, and the greatest to a thousand. That means one guy in the tribe of Gad, if he was a good one, a great warrior, he was equal to a thousand warriors of the enemy. I mean, that's just, that's like ridiculous. I, I, would, I read that and I'm like, oh, what a ridiculous exaggeration. But I think it might be true that one guy could be equal in the sight of God to a thousand of some other, you know, whoever they're going against, the enemy they're going against. He who was least was equal to a hundred of the enemy and the greatest to a thousand. These are the ones who crossed the Yardan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks and they put to flight all those in the valleys both to the east and to the west. So that means that from Gad, because they're on the border <clears throat> and they're on the frontier, from the greatest border of Israel. This is the biggest border in Israel. I mean, you got on the other side, you got the, the ocean, so who cares, the sea. But on this side, you got enemies over here. Ammonites, Girgashites, Amalekites, and others. Moabites. And if you don't have a strong border here, you're not going to make it. Well, these guys, Gad, they owned that land. And I'm going to show you why they owned it, because they chose to own it for a reason. And they were the first to go into Israel and just decimate the enemy. They led. And they led, not only during David's time, but they led in Moses' time. That's what I'm going to show you. Gad gadud yigudenu vahu yagud akev. As for Gad, troops will attack him, but he'll attack at their heels. So they're going to get attacked, but in the end, they're the warriors. They're the big ones. They're the ones who are going to get it done. Now, it's important that it says they went out in the first month in the time of David. Why? Because during the time of David and before, the first month is not when people went out to war. We know from first Sam, uh, first, second Samuel chapter 11 when, um, when uh, David ha uh, gets Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and he plots and plans to kill Uriah. Uriah, Uriah comes back and he says to David, I can't, I can't go home with my wife because all of Israel and Judah are dwelling in Sukkot at war. They've gone out to war, and now they're dwelling in Sukkot. How am I, I going to go home and you know refresh my wife? I can't do that. It's time to be out there. And so it says they were in Sukkot. Now that's the seventh month. These guys went out first in the first month. And it says in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it says it's mistranslated in the spring of the year doesn't say that. It says Hat Shuvat. It means the return of the year, which is Tishri. In Tishri, when kings go out to war. This is seven months before that, that Gad went out and fought. That makes them the leaders by seven months. And the rabbis, by the way, make a big deal about this. Why are they going out a seven months early? Because they're the leaders. They're the big ones. They're they're the shock troops of God. And what I'm going to tell you is this. If you think you're doing spiritual warfare, but you're not doing Judaism, you are not doing spiritual warfare. Not the way God gave it. You're not. You may be doing a little bit, which is not bad. It's not a bad thing. It's just not the way God gave it. God gave it for us to be the shock troops the killers with no mercy against the enemy. And there's a way to do this. And it's, well, we'll talk about it later. This is what's on the internet. It's all over the internet. That because they had lion-like faces and they scalped people, which we're going to talk about, they're 
the, the tribe of Gad is really the American Indians. And it's all over the internet. I mean, look. Look how their faces look like lions. With the downturned mouth and the wide nose and their fierce eyes, they look exactly like lions. This, this is another of the billions of examples of Christianity trying to take Judaism and cram it into our culture or our lives or our current events. It does not work. You cannot take God's Judaism and reform it and remeld it to your liking because you think you've got some big revelation and cram it into your life and say, oh, this is the real thing. It's not the real thing. The real thing was given to the Jewish people all the pictures, all the patterns, all the types, all the truths, all the stories, all of the ways of God were given to the Jewish people. Every one of them, 100% of them, were given through Moshe to the Jewish people, and before Moshe to the Jewish people. For you to try to reinvent the wheel, to come up with some other thing, I'll give a good example. The Jewish people have calculated, because of God, exactly when the festivals are. Since the first century for the next 2,000 years to within a, a, around a half a second. It's called lefech. To within around a half a second. And you're going to come along, and I've seen it on the internet, and reinvent the calendar of when to do the holy days, the mikrao, the festivals. You're a lightweight. You don't know what you're talking about. And only Christians do this. Messianic Jews do it because they're Christians for the most part. Some don't. Some follow what God gave the Jews, which is fabulous. But some don't. Some try to reinvent the wheel. If you are reinventing the wheel, you are a Christian. It's the best definition I can think of, of what a Christian is. You might think that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. Now, if you're a believer, just a believer, that's fine. That's fabulous. You should be a believer. But a Christian is different. A Christian is somebody who is Hellenized and follows a Hellenized Christ. Christ is not a guy. Christ is a word in Greek meaning Mashiach, Messiah. And, you know, I know, I'm, I know that I'm you know, swimming upstream, and I know I'm saying something that, you know, you think a flood is going to come and just wash me away. I know. I know how ridiculous this is, and how tiny and unknown this is. I know. But I don't care. I know God because of Judaism. And I have a relationship with God because I came through the Messiah, and I've learned Judaism. A little bit. So, if you don't follow what God gave the Jewish people. You're not doing it the right way. You're not seeing right. You're not seeing clearly the scriptures. I'll give you an example. I was taught this by Joe Good 35, 36 years ago. He, he was adopted into the Kiowa tribe. Jo, Joseph Good is the best uh, Bible learner I've ever seen in my life. And he's a Gentile. And he taught me Judaism. Um, and he, uh, he, he, said he was adopted into the Kiowa tribe. So I guess he had a lion-like face. But anyway, he says, he said, describe for me a tight big old sash. And I said, I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. He said, no, no, I, I want you to describe it for me. I want you to, in fact, I want you to make one. I'm going to give you a little bit of, a little bit of description. It's about four feet long, and it's made of beads, and blah, blah, blah. So I said, I, I don't know how to make a taipego. I don't even know how to say it. Taipego. I don't know what that is. He says, why can't you do it? Why can't you do it? He actually was nicer than me. Why can't you do it, Mikhail? And, and uh, I said, because I don't know what it looks like. And he said, that's Judaism. God gave 
how to do everything to the Jewish people. It's not in the Bible. All of the how-tos, none of them are in the Bible. None. They're in the Talmud and the Mishnah, mostly the Mishnah, and the Midrash. The how-to. I mean, how do you know how to picture what God is saying in the Bible? You have to have a description. Well, that's what the Mishnah is. The Jewish, the writings of the rabbis. Those evil writings of the rabbis. They'll tell you how to do things. Without that, all you have is your own imagination, and you end up reinventing the wheel. That's why the Jewish writings are so vitally important for us. Because without that, without a description of what things look like, how they're done, when they're done, why they're done, who does it, who doesn't do it, why you don't do it, you know, all the restrictions on doing it. If you don't have that, it's all up to you. And then you don't know what the Bible says. Because the Bible is where all those writings stem from. You've got to have something that tells you what it looks like. I still can't make a tie big o sash because I don't know what it looks like. But I know that in Judaism, I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel. I'm just going to figure out what they said. Get, put my world into their world. Not their world into mine. You have to go into the Bible world. You do not read the Bible from your Western American mindset and think you know what it's saying. We don't. We absolutely don't. So, this is very, very important. Don't be fooled by this foolishness that, you know, the tribe of Gad is the American Indians. They're not. They didn't get to America. So, this, uh, in Deuteronomy, where it says, he lies down as a lion and tears the arm, also the hairy scalp of the head, Christians looked at that and went, oh, they're scalping. They got to be American Indians. And look, their faces look like lions. Well, by God, it's got to be true. It's anything but. You have to let the Bible interpret the Bible, or else you don't know what you're talking about. He lies down as a lion and tears the arm, also the hairy top of the head. God were lions. They were lions from the beginning of the story, and they're lions at the end of the story. They never changed. But there are, and by the way, this is the word la vie. La vie, which I've never seen before. The word lev, those first two letters, lamed, va, uh, lamed vet, those first two lever, letters spell heart, lev. The name of our, the, our congregation is lev Zion, heart of Zion. Well, the first two letters are lev. And E makes it possessive. La vie, my heart. But it doesn't mean that. It means a lion. Isn't that interesting? A lion. And it means like from something that roars. One that roars. It's number 3833. Now there's five different words for lion in the Bible. But only la vie applies to God. Not the other ones. Except for one of them. But there are other tribes that were lions too. And you know the lion of the tribe of Judah. Everybody knows that. And uh, I never thought about this before. Excuse me. I never thought about this before. But the lion of the tribe of Judah is not really that big a thing. The line of the tribe of God is. And I never even considered it. And the reason everybody knows about the line of the tribe of Judah is because it says that in the book of Revelation chapter 5 about Yeshua. And so, because he was from Judah, he was a lion or the lion from the tribe of Judah. But God doesn't really make a big deal about the lion from Judah. He makes a big deal about the lion from God. So I'm like, why? What? I mean, this has been so hidden from me. I don't know anything about this. So that's why I'm teaching it, because I found it. So uh, in Revelation cha chapter 5, uh, in verse 5, it says, One of the elders said to me, Stop crying. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, 
has overcome so as to open the scroll and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb, not a lion, a lamb. So it, it, is, it is a thing, obviously, and it's, you'll find it all over the internet with posters and all that about the lion from the tribe of Judah, but nobody talks about the lion of God. And yet it's very important to God because God talks about it a lot. Now, Dan is also described as a lion. In Deuteronomy 33, just a couple verses after the one that we're looking at, he lies down as a lion and tears the arm, also the hairy top of the head. Just a couple verses later, it talks about Dan. And he gives the blessing and he says, Dan is a lion's whelp. That means like a, a, a young lion, like a cub, maybe this big, that has just, just been weaned. It means it's two years old. Dan is a lion's whelp who shall leap from Bashan. Bashan is way up north. This is Bashan up here. And Dan is here. You can see the tribe of Dan right here. But Bashan is over on the other side of the river. Bashan. This is not Bashan. And yet it says Dan will leap from Bashan. Puts him way up north, but it puts him on the other side of the river. That's another story. When we study Don, we'll talk about that. Right now, we're talking about this guy, God. So there are other tribes that are called lions. Now, all of Israel was also called lions. And this is very important. These prophecies that were given by the Gentile Satan-worshipping wizard, who was the greatest prophet on earth, Balaam, he... <laughs> he prophesied about Israel many times. Three separate occasions. Huge prophecies. One of them we say every single day. How, lo how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. That came out of the mouth of the wizard. And we say it every day. Numbers chapter 23 verse 24. Behold, a people rises like a lion, or lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the enemy or the slain. <laughs> so, three times it calls Israel a lion with different words. It does not have the word la vie in this, in this passage. Oh, I'm sorry, it does. It's translated as great lion in, in uh, King James, I believe. Israel rises up like a lavi, like a great lion. It's one of the words that uh, describes Israel. And lifts up like a, a young lion. It's a different word. Now in chapter 24, the wizard, the evil wizard, prophesies again. Chapter 24, verse 8. A little bit later, a little, few verses later. It says, God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the Ra'am. Can you do something with that, please? He is for him like the horns of the Re'im, Re'em. That's a oryx. He shall devour the nations who are his enemies. Israel will devour the nations that are his enemies. He will crush their bones in pieces and shatter with his arrows. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. So two times in a row. This wizard, this evil Gentile prophet, uh, prophesies about Israel being different words for a lion. And in this, it uses the word lavi as well. Who will rouse him up as a, as a lavi, as a roaring lion? Who's going to wake him up and mess with him? Now, um, the final part of this story about Israel being a lion culminates in something horrible. And that is that it culminates in Assyria being called a lavi. Now these are the only verses in the Bible other than the description of Gad and Israel that use the word lavi. It's the only verses. And it's always about Assyria. Every time. Isaiah chapter 5 has it. Hoshea 
13.8, who was a prophet to the north. Yoel, chapter 1, verse 6, also a prophet to the north. And Nahum, uh, no, Joel was to the south. And Nahum, also a prophet to the north, chapter 2. These are all about Assyria. But Assyria, like this, being sent by God to, to go eat up and destroy and do war against God's people. So in Isaiah chapter 5, this is the, the chapter that says, My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug and he, and he planted and he put a hedge around it and he created this beautiful vine and he waited for it to produce gorgeous grapes and it produced garbage. And this is Israel the vine. Well, in that passage of Isaiah chapter 5, it says that Israel, I'm sorry, Assyria is going to come as a lavi, as a roaring lion, to take Israel away. Northern Israel by Assyria and southern Judah by Babylon. So God uses the enemy as a lion. This is where the concept from in the New Testament comes from that the devil is a roaring lion seeking who he, whom he may devour. That's where this comes from. The enemy is a lavi, a roaring lion, looking for somebody to eat. And who is he sent to eat? Israel. Not Christians. Israel. So if you're a Christian and you want to apply that verse to you, you better put yourself into the Jewish world because that's who he's talking to and that's what he's talking about that's the context in Hoshea chapter 13 it says again God will come as a lavi against Israel and it's talking about Assyria the Assyrian invasion coming so again it's Assyria in Joel chapter 1 all this Joel chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. It's all about the Assyrian invasion in the day of the Lord. And this is about Assyria. It says a nation will come up against Israel with teeth like a lavi. With teeth like a roaring lavi. This is repeated in the book of Revelation, by the way. In the day of the Lord. And then in Nahum. The whole book of Nahum is against Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And God says, where are the lavi? Where are the roaring lions and then it's of Nineveh? And then it says that the lavi ripped up the bodies. And that's what these verses are talking about. That God would send Assyria to rip up the corpses and eat. Well, when God judges Assyria, then God says, oh, where's the big, strong, you know, roaring lions? Where's the lavi? So, the whole story of the roaring lion, of the Lavi, is not about the Messiah. It's about the enemy. And it's about God being like the enemy. In other words, having the same ferocity and an unstoppable nature as the enemy. That's Judaism. The Jewish people will never stop doing Judaism. Never. It doesn't matter what the world tries to do to us, we will never stop. Never. Because this is how we know God. You can put us on the rack, you can torture us, you can throw us in ovens, you can burn us up, kill us, kill our children, take everything away. It doesn't matter. We're not going to stop doing Judaism. Ever. Not even in the birth pangs of the day of the Lord. That's the closest we'll ever get to stopping doing Judaism. And even then we won't stop. Why? Because we're like this. We're not, you know, mild and meek about God. We are, we are driven. We are impelled by something inside of us that drives us to be as ferocious and angry and unstoppable as the enemy. Now, if you're not doing that, you're not going to stop the enemy. And then you might say, well, how come Jews were thrown in the ovens then? Because they stopped doing Judaism. The ones who stopped doing Judaism brought 
that idolatry, the way of the Gentile, into their lives, the Jewish people who did stop doing Judaism brought the ways of Hellenism into their life and idolatry. And so God sent the enemy like this to chew them up. But even in that, we didn't stop doing Judaism. We're never going to stop. This is Gad. Wielding a scimitar and just chopping. Unstoppably chopping. Happy Simchat Torah! <laughs> This is, this is why we rejoice over the Torah, because it's our life, and we're going to defend it to the death. Do you know that in, uh, on Kristallnacht in Germany in 1940-whatever it was, I um, can't remember the year, on Kristallnacht, when the Nazis said, we're just going to get rid of the Jews, they finally decided to make war on the Jews openly, and they smashed the windows of tens of thousands of Jewish owned homes, businesses, burnt synagogues to the ground all throughout Europe. When they did that, in the synagogues, the Jewish people, many of them, not all of them of course, but many of them didn't go for the gold and the silver and the furs and the di diamonds and the jewels and all their money and everything else that they owned. They went and they jumped on the Torah scrolls and saved the Torah scrolls. That's the Jewish heart. That's why we dance with the Torah. Because we're willing to die for it. There was a great movie. I love this movie. Um, back in the 70s. I think it was one of the very first... Who was the guy who, who was uh, on Star Wars? The, 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 the American dude in Star Wars? Who was with Wookiee? I can't remember his name. Harrison Ford. Yeah. I think it was one of Harrison Ford's very first movies, and he did it. It's called uh, The Frisco Kid. And um, there's a, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. The Jewish actor, he's got red hair. He's got like a Jew fro of red hair and a big beard, very skinny. Um, he was married to Gilda Radner. And he plays the, a rabbi. He's just like a bumbling idiot of a rabbi from Poland. He comes to America. And Harrison Ford helps him out, helps him navigate America. And uh, he's got a little Torah scroll, about this big. It's a little thing. And that's all he has to start a congregation in America. And the Indians, the Indians get him. And they, they put him on a spit over fire. And the chief says, will you trade your life? For Torah, because that's how the, he pronounced it. I think it's a Torah. And he says, will you trade your life for the Torah? And the rabbi says, no. And he says, will you trade your family for the Torah? No. Will you trade anything, your whole life, for the Torah? And he says, no. Go ahead and burn me up. And so they take him off the spit, and they dance with him. And they have a party. Because they saw that no matter what, we're not going to stop. You can't stop us. You cannot take Judaism away from us. We will never stop. Well, that's how Gad was. They're, they are the, they're the shock forces. They're the shock troop, troops that go out first to fight for whatever I'm going to show you that they were to fight for. So the verse says, He lies down as a lion and tears the arm, also the hairy top of the head. And Rashi said this, Tearing the arm of his prey together is the meaning with the head. In other words, the arm and the head together. Anyone slain by the Gadites could be readily identified because they used to cut off the head together with the arm in one blow. Now, Jonathan Ben Uziel wrote the Targum. Targum is like a working man's paraphrase of the Bible. And that's what it says in, in the Targum by Jonathan Ben Uziel. He said, it's together, the arm and the head together. And so with one blow, they chop off the arm and the head together. May or may not be true. I don't care. It's the right picture. Because with one blow, they chopped off the head 
which is a picture, and the arm, with the, which is a picture. The Bible defines the head throughout as thoughts, learning, and teaching. That's where we learn about God. We learn in our brain. That's how we learn God, with our brain. And your brain can be either thinking about the world or thinking about Judaism and God. And there's no in between. I mean, you, 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 can, you can work toward getting more Judaism and God and Israel and the kingdom over time, but you cannot walk on two divergent paths at the same time. So your mind is either going toward the right, toward Judaism and God, or toward the left, as it says in Ecclesiastes, I think it's chapter 7, toward the left, the evil, which is the way of the world. But you can't think both at the same time. So the arm, we know from many, many, many verses, that the arm is meaning works, do, deeds, doing stuff, actions. The arm of the Lord, the Zoroah Adonai, is the Messiah. Because with his mighty arm he did miflaot, wonders, miracles. By his mighty arm he saved us. Well, deeds, actions. And so the head is thoughts and learning, teaching, and the arm is deeds and actions and works of the flesh. And these guys chopped them off both together. They didn't chop one off. There, I've dealt with your head. And now I'm going to deal with your deeds. Not, not singularly. Together at the same time. This is magnificent. That's what the rabbis are saying. That with one stroke, if you can get like these guys, who have faces like lions, who are like the roaring lion, they're that fierce, if you can get like these guys, you can learn how to chop off both the thoughts and the deeds at the same time. Oh my God, that'll, that'll reduce our workload in half. Our workload being getting from a Gentile mind to a Jewish mind. Going from a Gentile world to a Jewish world. It's hard, and it takes time, but you can cut it in half. If you learn how to deal with these both at the same time, and I'm going to tell you the secret. I've been telling you for years what the secret is. It's pictures. Looking at the Bible as patterns is how you do this in one fell swoop. If you stop looking at the Bible as laws and commandments, because the Bible never says commandments, if you stop looking at it as commandments and look at it as a picture book, to tell, to show, to like lay out a picture for you, and you just look at it and go, oh, I get it. <laughs> it's simple. If you can do that, you can get these both taken care of at the same time. If you can't, if you can't do that, if you can't look at the Bible as pictures instead of laws, you will never, never cut that workload in half. Never. You will never be like this. Remember, Gad was at the border, on that long, biggest border that Israel had. And they went out first. They charged out first, and they led to take the land by force, to take the east side of the Jordan, the land of Israel on the east, by force, by fighting, by killing, by annihilating. And God said to do that. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard for people to understand. Well, why would God say kill people? I get it, because it's the right picture. Think of it as Nazis. I always say, I've been saying this for many, many years. Think of them as Nazis. If you don't kill the Nazis, the Nazis will kill your children. It is that simple. They are unstoppable. They have an agenda that they are not going to stop until every one of you is dead. Well, that's how the uh, seven nations in um, Israel were. They're not going to stop until they annihilate every Jewish thing on the planet. So think of it like that if it helps. And it should help. So these guys went out first and they chopped they chopped off the thoughts and the evils to, evil deeds together, not separately but in one blow. 
I mean, you know, I guess you had to be pretty skilled with that scimitar to get, you know, the right cut angle to get the head and the arm chopped off. But then when the battle's over and you walk around, you go, oh, there, Gad was here. That guy is missing an arm and a head. So you know Gad was there. So if you want to do spiritual warfare, this is the way you got to do it. Now after that, it says here in, in uh, um, Vazot HaBracha, and this is the blessing, then he provided or saw for himself the first part. For there was the lawgiver's portion hidden or covered or preserved. <clears throat> it's the word safon. Safon. And it means to hide or conceal or bury or to heap up. To like heap up as a treasure, sort of. So that's why I translated this covered or, or preserved. It's hidden. So, in the tribe, or in the land of God, was the lawgiver's portion hidden. What, what does that mean? So, Rashi said, said this, That portion of the field where Moshe was buried was hidden, Safon, and concealed from every creature, as it is said, and no man knows his burial place to this day. There's two areas, two locations, that nobody knows where they are. And only two in the Bible. I'm talking about the Bible. And only two. Number one is the tree of life and Eden. Nobody knows where the tree of life is. Nobody can find it. And the other one is the burial place of Moshe. They've never, they're never going to find that. Because it's been sapon, hidden. God hid it on purpose. And he hid it in Gad. So Gad saw for himself the first part. That means they go out first. They took for themselves the leadership role. Why? Because in their land that they wanted, that they took, that they chose to have, in their land, Moshe, his burial place, was hidden. Now here's the land of Reuben in green, and here's the land of Gad in purple. Now the reason I made it purple, I don't know why this happened. I was doing the illustration, and I said, I'm going to make that purple. So then I thought, well, wait a minute, I wonder what their, I wonder what their, um, their stone and the breast piece was. So I went to my book, when all the pictures are restored, I opened up to the color illustration of the breast piece, and it was amethyst. It's purple. Wow, I thought the right thing. I'm happy about this because it rarely happens that I actually do or think the right thing. So I was like really happy about this. I guess God showed me to make it the color of amethyst, because that was their stone. It's achlama in Hebrew, which means dream stone. A, a, a chalom is a dream. And so amethyst, for some reason, is a dream stone. Well, look at the color. Purple. Royal. Like, like in the Bible, it describes royalty as two colors. Uh, um, blue and purple. Purple because it's a mixture of blue and red. Now, on the tzitzit is the blue. It, it has techelet, which is the blue. Purple is achlama, which is a mixture of the techelet, the blue, and the blood of a crushed worm. <laughs> the red it comes from a crushed worm. And it's called uh, sheni. The, the worm. And so you put these two together, red of blood and the blue of the heavens, and you get purple. In my opinion, this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. The purple is a picture of the kingdom. You may have a different opinion, that's fine, but that's my, my opinion. So in that land of God, there's a field, and in that field is the burial place of Moshe. And it's hidden. Now, in Jude, I don't know why I don't have Jude here. It's probably behind the map. But in Jude, chapter, there's only one chapter, verse 9. It says, but Michael, the archangel, when he argued with the devil. Why is this in the Bible? He argued with the devil about the body of Moshe. He didn't dare to pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, Yehovah rebuke you. Why is that in the Bible? 
Isn't that weird? The entire book of Jude is about the day of the Lord. All you got to do is read it. You can see many, many, many references um, to what the prophets said about the day of the Lord, the birth pangs in the day of the Lord. So this is a picture of the day of the Lord. Michael, the angel, he argued with the devil about the body of Moses. What do you think that argument was? What do you think they argued about? Like how to bury it? Where the burial place is? We're not going to show you devil? I mean, what, what was the argument about? It's weird. It's just a weird thing to have in the Bible. Well, this comes from two sources in Judaism. Actually, many more, but the two main ones uh, I've, I've given to you here. The general Jewish traditions, there were a lot of them, but they came from, they stemmed from Michael as the grave digger of the just, of the, of the righteous. Because that's written about in the Apocalypse of Moses, which is a book, non-canonical Jewish book, called the Apocalypse. Now, Apocalypse means revelation. So this is the revelation, the book of revelation of Moshe. And the accusation by Michael of Azazel in the book of Enoch. So Azazel is the devil? Yes. Yes, in Judaism, Azazel is one of the names of the devil. Azazel is the scapegoat. You remember there's two lots at Yom Kippur that the high priest pulls out of a urn a basket type of thing. He pulls out two lots. One of them is La Azazel. That means to this goat. That's Azazel. And he puts it on the head. And then he pulls out a lot that is La Le Yehovah. To the Lord. Of the Lord. And he puts that on the other goat. The one that's La Azazel, they take out in the wilderness and they push it over a cliff, cliff and they stone it. But the one that's to the Lord is the sacrifice that is offered at Yom Kippur. One of the sacrifices offered at Yom Kippur. So, on Yom Kippur, there is God and the devil. And the devil is defeated. He's pushed off a cliff in the stone. Well, Azazel is the devil. It's one of his names. And there's a whole story about this accusation by Michael an accusation accusing Azazel in the book of Enoch, which is another non-canonical Jewish book. So that's where this whole thing came. You mean Jude, the brother of Yeshua, is quoting Jewish non-canonical books? Why would he do that? That's weird. Why isn't he speaking Christian things and Christian words? Why is he quoting... Jewish books of the rabbis that aren't even in the Bible. There's a lot more in the New Testament that's, that quotes non-canonical Jewish books. But this is a very, very clear one. And the reason is it's important. There was some huge argument that took place here in the very bottom of God's territory. Here's Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is, God said, go up on Mount Nebo and die. So he was buried a little bit north of Mount Nebo in the field, it says, in the Bible. It says, in the field, up there in Gad somewhere. And so Gad, to protect, now think about this, to protect the body of Moshe, they become these wars that we want that land. Nobody's going to get near that body. And they do it before Moshe even dies. Because they saw that somebody needed to be the first to fight for the body of Moses. Now, a um, couple months ago, I taught about the body of Messiah is really the body of Moshe. It says that in Hebrews chapter 3. It says, just like the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself, so Messiah has more uh, honor than the body of Moshe. Moshe, it's his house. It's the house of Moshe. And it says that. And so when you think body of Christ, that's a horrible phrase. I'm sorry, but it's awful. 
Because when you say Christ, you are training your mind to look at Jesus as a Gentile. I don't care what argument you come up with, that's what you're doing. When you say the word Christ, if you tra translate and trade it for the word Messiah, your mind will change and you'll start thinking him truly as a Jew. And you'll start thinking of the body of Messiah as the body of Moshe, Judaism. And these guys are fierce to fight for the body of Moshe. That's what you would call the church. In churches all over the world, every day, pastors and leaders and elders and deacons and all kinds of leader people in leadership pray for the body of Christ. It's They're shooting, but they're shooting amiss. If they would pray some Jewish prayers and then more Jewish prayers and more Jewish prayers and more Jewish prayers and integrate that into their prayers I think that what will happen is that their mind will begin to shift and their prayers will become more what really is spiritual warfare what really is spiritual warfare which God gave to the Jews not to Christians I know these are hard words I know that they're, they go against everything you've been taught. But God gave these prayers for a reason. And there's hundreds of them. And they're, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to go there. I'll just say that they're important and they, they, need to be, they need to be looked at and studied and prayed. And over time, spiritual warfare can then morph into what really is spiritual warfare. Not hocking and spitting and laying on the ground and screaming and, and uh, the worst thing of all, I rebuke you, Satan. Michael didn't even do that. When he's arguing about the body of Moshe, it even says it. He didn't dare to pronounce against the devil, Azazel, a railing judgment, but said, Yehovah rebuke you. Not me, Yehovah. And yet, Christians all over the world, even right now, some are praying, I rebuke you, Satan. We don't have that authority. Nobody does. Not even the angels do. And we certainly, we certainly can't do spiritual warfare just quoting scripture that we think applies. You better know what scripture to apply. And you're not going to find it in a little Christian prayer book. You're not going to find it. You're going to find it in Judaism. So uh, that's really all I want to say about that. It's a whole other world to walk into. But I, w I, would, I would ask that you would start thinking about it. Just start thinking about it. Start thinking about it. where did these prayers come from? In Christianity, I mean. Where did rebuking the devil come from? Where did, like, you know, just some, somebody's got a cold. Or somebody's got a broken arm. I rebuke you, devil. I've seen this with my own eyes. I've heard it with my own ears. I don't think the devil's even involved in that stuff. But I'd ask that you'd start thinking about it. Yes, uh, the whole concept of binding and loosing. That's a Jewish concept. It's a Jewish concept. So if you're going to use that concept, you need to find out how the Jewish people looked at it and viewed it and wrote about it, talked about it. So if you're really going to do spiritual warfare like these lion-like people of God, you got to learn how to do this properly. Now remember, the land of Gad is filled with warriors. And they're there to protect the body of Moshe. So nobody can find it. Just like the choppers are like, these, these guys are choppers. They chop off the arm and the head. The choppers are like the flaming sword that protects the location of the tree of life. Nobody can find it. And nobody will ever find it. Until it grows and spreads and fills the world in the kingdom. That's what the tree of life and the and Eden are 
They are like the seed of the kingdom, which is going to grow and fill the whole earth until the whole world knows God. And the knowledge of the Lord fills the earth like waters cover the seed. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, it says, So he drove the man out, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. And notice it's on the east. Well, the land of Gad is on the east of the Yarden to protect Israel itself, because that is the tree of life. Judaism and Israel is the tree of life, and it's going to grow and spread and fill the earth. So these guys are the choppers. They're the protection to, um, to the way of life. Now remember, Hebrews chapter 3, 7 through 4.10, we're not going to go through the whole thing, over and over and over and over and over again, it says one thing until it drives it into your mind, and yet people still don't get it. It seems to me, I mean, this may be stupid on my part, but it seems to me like the more God repeats something, the more people don't get it. If he says it twice, they're like, no, I get it. If he says it 15 times, you're like, no, no, I'm going to change it. I'm going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to fix it, instead of it just getting it even easier. I mean, that's just me. But in this passage of Hebrews, God says it over and over and over and over again. He says that there is a time period called today. He puts it in the time of Moses. He puts it in the time of David. He puts it in the first century. He put, I put it in our time because he's talking to believers. So for the last 2,000 years, it's all called today. But there's a time period, a day coming after that, he says. He calls it a day. He calls it Shabbat. He calls it a seventh day. And he calls it rest. Over and over and over and over again. And it says, if Yeshua or Joshua, it says if Joshua had given them, the wanderers in the desert, during the time of Moshe, who were stationed in Kadesh, in the desert, the, the Jewish people with Moshe, if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. And it quotes the promise, I'm going to bring you into the land, I'm going to bring you into the land, I'm going to bring you into the land, I'm going to bring you into the land. And then it says, he would not have spoken of another day, not land after that. So, there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest, his menucha in Hebrew, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. And when did God rest? On the seventh day and he called it the Shabbat. Now that is the kingdom. That is the Malchut or Malchut HaShemayim kingdom of heaven. It's all the same thing. The kingdom what the church, it, in a misinformed way, calls the millennium. The Bible never calls it the millennium. It is a millennium, which is a thousand years, because all these days are a thousand years long, just like the kingdom is a thousand years long. And so the church calls it the millennium, but the millennium is the malchut, the kingdom. It calls it the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, so all those hundreds of verses that you read Yeshua saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, that's this. That's the kingdom of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is like, now they had to fight to get the land. Joshua led them into the land, but that it was not what God was after. He was after leading them into a day. And the land is just a little picture of that day. Which is why I say the land is going to get bigger and bigger and fill the earth. The land of Israel. The land of Israel is a little microcosm picture of the kingdom. And so Joshua 
interchangeable name with Yeshua. If Yeshua had given them rest, he would, he would not have spoken of another day, not land, after that. But they had to fight for that land. And the ones who first went in to fight for it was Gad. They led. The tribe of Gad led them in. Not Joshua, the tribe of Gad. Everybody thinks Joshua led them in. No, Joshua did not lead them in. The tribe of Gad were the leaders, the first warriors. And the reason they did it was for the sake of Moshe, for the sake of Moshe's body. They did it so that, so that they could protect the body of Moshe. So they provided for themselves the first part, the best, the first. They made themselves the first. Why? Because of their love of the Torah, their love of Moshe. Remember in the New Testament, Torah and Moshe are synonymous several times. It doesn't even say Torah or, or law. It says Moshe. Uh, Acts chapter 15, for Moshe is read in the synagogue every Shabbat. No, he's not. Torah is. So it's interchangeable, Moshe and Torah. And so to fight, to protect Judaism, Moshe, that's what spiritual warfare is. Spiritual warfare is to fight for Judaism, to protect, to preserve Moshe, Moshe's body, Judaism. Now, if you're going to do proper spiritual warfare, that is supposed to be your target. That's why I do what I do. Every time I teach pictures, every time I teach, quote, Judaism, I am doing spiritual warfare to protect and preserve and lift up the body of Moshe. Judaism. I'm making myself like the tribe of Gad. I'm not saying I'm like the tribe of Gad, but I'm making myself like that. And I do it on purpose. I fight for this stuff. And I do it with love. Because that was their motivation. Love was the motivation of the tribe of Gad. Because after these verses that we just read, then it says, he came with the heads of the people, did righteousness of the Lord. Well, that's love. Everything that's righteous about God is love. God is love. And by the way, in this passage, it says, God loved the people. God loved the people. Yeah, Israel. He came with the heads of the people and did righteousness of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. Now in Genesis chapter 22, when, when Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Yitzchak on the altar. <clears throat> there's a promise that God gives because he did that. And there's one little part of it that people don't really think about much. I've never heard it talked about very much. But this is where spiritual warfare began. This is the first time you see spiritual warfare in the Bible. It says, uh, 22, 17 through 18, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, Abraham, I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed will possess the gate of their enemies. Your seed, Abraham, the Jewish people, Israel, will possess the gate of the enemy. Christians do not know what a gate is. Jews do. A gate is a big room. It is not a swinging wrought iron thing. It's not a door. That's the doors to the gates. The gate is a room where judgments are made. And when you come to the New Testament and it uses the word gate, your mind, you picture a big wrought iron door. And this is a huge problem. You may think it's a small thing. It's not a small thing. It's a big thing. Because he says that Israel, the seed of Abraham, will possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you've listened to my voice. So what? They, own, they will possess a big wrought iron door. 
Who cares? But if a gate is a place where they gather to make judgments, that's important. And it doesn't say the gates attack us. It says we attack those gates. Like this. Chop off the arm and the head in one fell swoop. That's what this is about. Now in Matthew 11, you come to the New Testament, and you have this picture of a big wrought iron door, and it just messes up your theology. Because it says, from the days of John the Mikvah man, this first time I've ever translated the immerser, because people say the Baptist, and that is such a horrible thing. Baptizer is not much better. Mikvah-er is not even a... Man, I can't even say that in English. Mikvah-er. John the Mikvah-er. So I put Mikvah man. John the Mikvah man, until now, the kingdom of heaven, the Malchut HaShemayim, the kingdom of heaven, the day of the Lord, suffers violence. And violent men take it by force. If you want the kingdom in your life, you got to fight for it. And it doesn't come from studying or reading the New Testament. I'm sorry, it doesn't. And it doesn't come from doing Christian rites, like communion. It doesn't. It doesn't come, certainly, by p keeping Christian holy days, Easter and Christmas, that disgusting pagan Saturnalia of Christmas, the disgusting Ishtar, that's where the word Easter comes from. Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of fertility. It doesn't come from Christianity. It can't because it's too infected with Hellenism, the way of the Greek. You have to pull yourself out of that and go get by force all this Jew stuff. I know because I do it. I have to do it just like you have to do it. And to the extent that I do it, I get it. And to the extent I don't do it, I'm stuck in Hellenism. I'm an art teacher in middle school. And I see so many principles that I, I teach art with that are biblical. And this is one of them. And I, when I say biblical, I mean like pictures. Seeing the Bible as a book of pictures not laws and you know what all that engenders I see so many principles like that in art the way I teach art and this is one of them uh, I just said it yesterday to the kids I tell them to the extent that you shut the voice up in your head that tells you and, and it's like this you can't draw people arms heads hands and that's how I say to the kids that voice comes out strong I'm 60 years old. I've been doing art ever since I was 14. And that voice still comes at me and tells me, you can't draw people. You can't draw hands. And to the extent that I shut that voice up is the extent to which I can see the shapes that make up the things. The people, the hands, the arms, the heads, the whatever I'm looking at. But if I don't shut that voice up, I can't see and then I can't draw. And this is what I tell the kids. To the extent that you can shut that voice up is the extent to which you will see more and more and more shapes. Well, this works the same exact way. To the extent that you can pull yourself out of Hellenism and shut that voice, that Hellenistic voice from Greece that tells you, Christ, instead of, Messiah with some intensity and some Judaism to the extent that you can do that is the extent to which you can get the kingdom into your life and you will see you'll see the kingdom but it's up to you you gotta fight for it and I tell the children and middle schoolers this you have to fight that voice you have to fight for it, because it ain't going to go away. It's going to keep coming at you hard. 
And so it is with Hellenism. It's going to keep coming at you hard, especially if you're a Jew. So, you know, I'm in the same boat you are. I got to fight it just like you have to fight it if you want to know what God originally said. And if you want to see what God originally designed and put into his Bible. So he says, from the days of John the Amicba man until now, the kingdom of heaven, the Malchut HaShemayim, suffers violence. And violent men take it, the kingdom, by force. And those are the ones who get it. And the ones who don't, don't. Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you, Peter, that you are Petros. Petros, which means a pebble, a little rock. It may, actually means like a, it has within the, the sense of the Greek, a movable thing. That means a small rock, something you can move. Portable. A little rock, a small stone, a piece of a rock. You are Petros, and upon this Petra, which means a huge rock, a cliff, like a, like a little bit of a mountain, a huge cliff, a big rock. Now in Hebrew, it's the word sur, and all Jews know this from Maos sur, strong sur, strong rock, our shadow, in time, our help, our shield, from uh, Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 32. And upon this Petra, this big rock, this sewer, I will build my congregation. And the gates of hell, now I, I've heard Christians preach this for years and years, and they miss it every time. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. That's what they say. And uh, one year, I think I was a believer maybe six years or something like that, five years, and I stopped to think about what they were saying, and I said, wait a minute. The gates of hell will not prevail against, against you. That means the gates of hell are coming at me. Gates don't move. I mean, even if you picture like a big swinging door, that doesn't move. That's the door of a room. Even if you think a gate is a swinging door, a swinging wrought iron thing, even at that you're wrong to say the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You're wrong. Gates don't move. We attack them. And they won't be able to stand against our attack. And that's what God said to Abraham. Your seed will possess, get, the word in Hebrew is kach, take, kach. Your, the gates, they're not going to be able to stand against you coming and taking them. Your seed will possess, own, take the gate of their enemies. So we're the attackers, not, not the enemy. We're the attackers. If we're not, then the enemy is. And we just lay down and take it. And that's what the church has done for 2,000 years. They just laid back and took it. You want to take my Judaism away? Go ahead. You want to take Shabbat away and twist it into Sunday? Go ahead. You want to take away the Jewish prayers and turn them into Christian prayers? Go ahead. You want to take all the Judaism and gut it from Moses' body? Go ahead. Replace it with Greek ways. Go ahead. And that's what the church has done. But there are... There have always been people who fought against that, who fought for to retain the Jewish nature of God's body. There have always been. Most of them were Jews. That's why you don't know about them. Because they were killed. They were martyred. And the church certainly didn't want to hear from them because it's all that Jew stuff that we don't want. We're the violent. We're the violent. The believers are the violent. Not the enemy. Because the enemy is violent already. And if you're going to stand against them, you better get as violent as them. You better be as unmerciful 
and unyielding as that lion who roars, who goes to the fight first. And it's not by going, oh, Christ, oh, thank you, loving Christ, thank you, I bind you, Satan. I ain't going to do nothing. Nothing. If you're going to fight, you've got to fight the way God gave to the Jews to fight. So you, you need to learn, at least start learning some of the prayers. And then see that in those prayers is exactly what Yeshua said. Every time. I can see Yeshua's words in every Jewish prayer. That's taken years to do that, but I can do it. I'm sure there's a lot of prayers I haven't read. But the ones I've read, I can see Yeshua's words in them. I know where he got them from. I know that they became flesh, just like the Torah, and became a guy, Yeshua. So, Yeshua said, Peter, Petros, you're a little rock. But on this huge rock of what you just said, and what he just said was, you are the Mashiach, the son of the living God. And then Yeshua said, you know what? Nobody showed you that. The Holy Spirit showed you that, that I am the Mashiach, the Messiah. And on that rock, that I am the Mashiach, Yeshua said, I'm going to build my congregation, which is Jewish. I will build my congregation, and the gates of hell will not be strong against it. If you don't believe me, check the Greek. Will not be strong against it. They will not win. It just means win. That's all it really means. It's either fighting or defending. It's either one. It just means to win. The gates of hell will not win against it. Because we're doing the attacking. So you've got to take the Messianic Kingdom by force. By doing what these guys did. Righteousness of the Lord and judgments with Israel. Well, what are the mishpatim? What are the judgments? Judaism. That's what the mishpatim are in the Bible. In the Bible, mishpatim judgments are Jewish things. The festivals, the kosher laws, the new moon, the Shabbat, those are the Mishpatim. Well, these guys did that before they even existed. And one of those things was to fight, to go out first and fight for Israel and to protect the body of Moshe. That's righteousness. So, I'm going to reread these words of the song that I sang. In Hebrew, Noda Bihuda Elohim. Noda, knowledge. Bihuda, in Judah. In Judah, in the Jews, Elohim. God is known. Elohim, God, is Bihuda in Judah is known. Noda. Noda. If you want the knowledge of God, you must go into this, into this world. You cannot get this and pull it into your world. You can't. It doesn't work. You've got to fight. You've got to fight for it. Because you've got the entire Gentile Hellenistic world coming at you, telling you one thing in the church, in Messianic Judaism, and you got Judaism saying something else. And what that thing they're saying is not Jesus is not the Messiah. That's not what they say. They tell us how to know God. Now, along with that is the foolishness of them saying, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. But who cares? Christians say that too. Who cares? But you listen to them, and they weren't given in all of God's ways in the beginning. The Jews were. Which is why it says in Psalm 116, Noda bihuda Elohim. God is known in Judah. But Yisrael, and it is not different from the Jews. It's not the Christians. 
But Yisrael, in Israel, Gadol Shamo. Great is his name. Well, his name is not great in the church. I'm sorry. It's not. It's not. His name is small in the church. And what I mean by that is you have millions and millions of Christians who, who quote, love God. And I put that in quotes because that's a huge sliding scale. Millions and millions of Christians who, who quote, love God and hate his ways. Hate Judaism. Hate the Jewish prayers. Hate Israel. Hate, I mean, my God, the Jewish, in, uh, the Israel divestiture movement, BDM, to get rid of anything of Israel. You know where the fastest growing locale of that is? It's not in the Arabs. It's in the church. Well, why is that? Because they have a voice that's been there for 2,000 years barking Hellenism at them, at us, at us. And the only way to shut it up is to shut it up and fight for that kingdom. Fight for that kingdom. If you're going to get anything from God that you really want, you got to know what you want. If you want money, go get money. If you want prestige, go get prestige. If you want fame, go get fame. But it has nothing to do with God. Nothing. The only thing that we should want is one thing. Noda bihuda Elohim. God is known in Judah to know God, the knowledge of God. If that ain't your number one, this whole thing don't matter anyway. It doesn't matter because you're chasing the Gentile way. Yeshua said, why are you worried about what you wear, what you eat, what you drink, what you, you know, your, your physical stuff? Seek first the day of the Lord, the Malchut Shemaim, and all that stuff will come to you. You don't need to worry about it. Now, if you worry about it, and you're chasing it, and you'll do everything in your power to get it, that has nothing to do with taking the kingdom and knowing God, because they are synonymous. Taking the kingdom and knowing God is synonymous. It's the same thing. That's how you get to know God. You get that stuff that's not even here yet, that will be here shortly, in the kingdom, and you pull it back to you, and you make it part of your life. And that way you walk out the kingdom now. And all of it looks, smells, tastes, sounds Jewish. All of it. 100% of it. None of it sounds, quote, Christian. Now, if you got, you know, Christianity melded with Judaism, good for you. Then when I say none of it sounds Jewish, I mean none of it sounds Christian, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those who embrace Hellenism and reject Judaism. So I, I hope I've made this clear. I know it's a very, very small thing. But from now on, if you can, don't think so much about the line of Judah. I think we got that one down. Think about the line of God, the real warriors. Judah didn't go out first. God did. There's only one verse that says Judah went out first. Only one. But from Genesis through Deuteronomy all the way to 1 Chronicles, Gad went out first. So not the line of Judah so much. The line of Gad. Really the same thing. And remember, Gad joined David, the house of Judah. That's when they went. That's when they joined to be the warriors. From Gad, I don't, know, I don't want to put it on those Indians. From Gad came David, came to David, the tribe of Judah, men who were warriors, better than all warriors, even better than Judah warriors. So what I'd encourage you to do is start learning some of the prayers of Judaism. 
And if you're bored by them, your mind is going the wrong direction. That means you're not seeing. You're not looking at what you should be looking at. You should be looking to see the kingdom. You should be looking to see all the embedded pictures of Yeshua and the kingdom in them. And they are there. Believe me, they're there. So that's what I'd encourage you to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Abba, I ask that your Ruach would seal like, like your signet ring in wax of a, of a scroll. I'd ask that you'd seal this very small seed into everybody who hears us, into all of our hearts, and more importantly, into all of our spirit, our neshama, our ruach, and that it would grow, that it would produce fruit and grow, and that you would teach us how to pray. Teach us how to do, quote, spiritual warfare, Lord, because we do not know. We just don't know how. And I ask that you would teach us bit by bit by bit so that we could see and learn more and more of your ways that you gave to your people Yehuda, that you gave to your people Yisrael, Judah and Israel. In the name of Yeshua, thank you for this amazing day of Shemni Atzeret, the conclusion, the end of all things for this season. And ask that you give us great joy. And Lord, bring rain. Bring rain. Pour out your rain. Pour out your Ruach HaKodesh on your people, Israel. And bring them to you in droves. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.